Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm one of the interns. Um, just going to get started off with a case. So a 28 year old male is tackled during a not so friendly game of Thanksgiving football and has acute onset of pain in the right shoulder. So starting with a survey question. So I'm sending a survey in the WhatsApp. Um, so everyone can go on that and answer, um, select all that apply, which of these x-rays are abnormal. With like 20 more seconds. Okay, so almost everybody said um, C. And then uh, which, uh, what is C showing? Kind of more obvious. So it's a shoulder dislocation. Um, and then the next most popular answer was D, um, which is a AC joint injury. Um, and then the next most common answer was A, which is a clavicular fracture. And then um, Fewest people chose B, uh, which is also abnormal. It is also an AC joint separation. So all of these x-rays are abnormal um, and just trying to highlight all the different things that we have to be looking at when we're looking at someone with a shoulder injury, um, looking for dislocations, clavicular injury, um, as well as the AC joint. So topic of today is AC joint injuries. So learning objectives, overview of shoulder injuries and x-rays, distinguishing between AC joint separation types, identifying those types on x-ray and then determining appropriate management based on that. Um, and thank you to the small talk team for helping me with, that, with this presentation. So um, thinking of the differential diagnosis for shoulder injuries, um, we have your bony diagnoses like we just talked about and saw the clavicular fracture, a shoulder dislocation, also looking for the hill sacs or bank art lesions, humeral fracture, scapula fracture is less likely, um, and then ligamentous injuries, including the AC joint, and then tendinous, uh, rotator cuff, bicep tendon, uh, tendon rupture, bicep tendon rupture. Um, and so just overview of the x-ray and what we're looking for. Um, the joint that we're talking about today is that AC joint right here, um, looking for a distance less than eight millimeters. Um, as people get older, that space narrows. And so uh, might be significantly less than eight millimeters. Um, there's also this coracoclavicular joint space um, and some ligaments that attach there. And that should be at a distance of uh, less than 13 millimeters. Um, and then also just for structures. So the acromion is here. This is the coracoid process, both of the scapula, humeral head and the glenoid fossa. So exam and workup for an AC injury. So it's a very common shoulder injury. Um, one of the most common mechanisms is impact on an adducted shoulder. Um, you can assess specifically for AC joint tenderness. So following the clav clavicle out to its distal edge, seeing where that ends and finding tenderness right in that joint space. And then you can also have tenderness along the coracoclavicular joint, um, which is the big prominence in the anterior part of the shoulder um, and then feeling just above that. Um, the AC joint compression test is taking this, it's this image here. So taking the arm, adducting it across the body and they may have increased pain with that. Um, if you have high suspicion for an AC injury, these are the talking about like which x-rays you wanna be focusing on. And so um, you can get AC specific views for the x-ray and the benefit of that is a little bit less uh, radiation penetration. And also that the regular shoulder x-rays can sometimes overexpose that specific joint um, and the coracoclavicular joint. And you can have a more difficult time really figuring out those uh, joint space distances. Um, you wanna be getting AP and axillary views and we'll talk later about why that's so important. 
Um, and then also considering bilateral x-rays. And this is just because um, it's more difficult to measure something on an x-ray than it is like on a CT. Um, and again, this joint space is variable in people. So somebody might have one of seven millimeters and that's normal. Someone might have a space of three millimeters and that's normal for them. And so you might need both sides to be able to compare if this is a significant widening. Um, and then lastly, considering a Zanka view, which is basically the AP view, but um, as demonstrated in this picture, it's just a little bit of an angle to um, really highlight that joint space. So the anatomy of the AC joint, um, like we've already talked about, the distal clavicle here, the AC ligament is right there. And these are your caracoclavicular ligaments extending from the coracoid to the edge there. So these are the different types of AC joint injuries and we'll go through them one by one. Um, it's a pretty natural progression moving on from type one to type two, going from just more strain of the ligaments to one tear to multiple tears with displacement of the bone. And so we'll go through that here. So type one, this is where you have just a strain of just the AC ligament. Nothing is torn, but you may just have a um, subtle widening of that joint space. This was um, choice B on the um, survey earlier. And so it can be a really subtle, easily missed injury. Um, and actually in my pediatric shift yesterday, there was a patient that had to be called back because the initial radiologist um, didn't, didn't see anything. And then the attending overread thought that there was a slight space widening and he was called back to do um, bilateral x-rays to get a comparison. Um, and so in this case, on the right side, this is where there is a little bit of joint separation, um, which is might be difficult to determine on just that one. But when you compare it to the left side, you can see that there is a significant difference between those two sides. Um, so we just talked about. So disposition for these patients is basically just uh, based on their pain tolerance. And so um, they rest ice laying as needed for pain, but as soon as they're able to tolerate range of motion, able, able to tolerate strengthening exercises, they can do that. Um, and then returning to sports and work is kind of the same thing. If they're not having significant pain, they can start doing those activities um, and they can just have routine orthopedic follow-up. Type two is the next progression where now you have an actual tear of the AC ligament, but that coracoclavicular ligament is still intact. Um, and so you do, there's not a lot of displacement of the distal clavicle, um, but there is a little bit more than in the type one because now you have actual tearing. And so there's more noticeable joint space widening as well as um, maybe a little bit of superior or inferior distal clavicular displacement. And so just looking here, if you were to like follow the edge of um, each of the bones here in the joint, you can see that there's a bit of a step off. And so disposition for these patients um, is just a slightly more conservative. So rest, ice, sling for three to seven days. And um, for them, it's more about range of motion and strength uh, that's gonna determine when they're able to go back to sports or work. Um, so it's everything that as, able, as they're able to tolerate um, and then also routine orthopedic follow-up. Type three is the next progression. And so in this case, you have tearing of both the AC and CC ligaments and a more significant joint dislocation. Main thing that separates this on X-ray from a type two is that you have now the inferior edge of the distal clavicle is superior to the superior edge of the acromion. Um, and this is one of the more controversial uh, types in terms of disposition. There are a few patients that may end up getting surgery for this, um, but it's not like really clear that who, who those people are. Um, and so these patients, same thing as far as rest, ice, sling, um, but more conservative, two to three weeks, um, uh, return to sport or work only after six to 12 weeks of rest. And they should have orthopedic follow-up within one week. Again, um, so we don't need to be consulting orthopedics in the emergency department for this, but we do need to be, maybe give them a call, assure that this patient can get seen in the next week in case they are somebody who is a surgical candidate. Type four, um, so in this case, we have AC and CC ligaments torn as well as joint dislocation and posterior clavicular displacement, um, which is often in or through the trapezius muscle in the back here. Um, and so now we're starting to move into injuries that are higher risk for neurovascular compromise. Looking at the anatomy of the shoulder here, you see that you have the brachial plexus and the subclavian arteries and veins. If you have posterior displacement of that um, clavicle, you have higher risk of injury to those structures. Um, and so this is where that axillary view is super important. Looking at this x-ray, the AP view here, this looks just like a type three that we just looked at and it is really not gonna be a way to differentiate it um, unless you get this axillary view here. So what we're looking at here 
is this is this red process here is the acromion process and you have the clavicle here and it's overlying the process and you expect these to be abutting one another kind of like in this image here so it's flipped but again you have the acromion here and this is where you expect the clavicle to be um, and in this case they're overlying and so this is how these two types are differentiated and it's very important to differentiate these two types because a type 4 injury um, does require emergency department orthopedic consult um, for possible urgent surgical repair um, and of course if there's any nerve vascular compromise on exam, it would require a more emergent uh, intervention. Type five is, again, we're all, we're in the realm now where the AC and CC ligaments are torn. Um, the difference in this is that you also have um, disturbance of the uh, delta, deltoid and uh, trapezius fascia. And now you have nothing tethering that distal clavicle and you have a much more noticeable superior displacement of that distal clavicle. Um, the clavicle is untethered. It's very unstable. Um, it's more common to have like skin tenting or like more noticeable dis, um, deformity on exam with this one. Um, and the spe specification is that it's 200 to 300% above the acromion. So it's not just that the inferior edge is in line with the superior edge of the acromion, it's much more noticeably displaced. This also is going to require emergency department orthopedic consult for possible urgent surgical repair and always looking for neurovascular compromise. The last type uh, is type six. This one is uh, pretty rare. All the uh, ligaments are torn and now you have an inferior displacement of the distal clavicle, um, a little bit more obvious on that AP view. Um, and again, this is going to be ED orthopedic consult for urgent surgical repair. So take home points, um, AC joint tenderness should be specifically assessed on our exams um, rather than just checking range of motion, just checking um, tenderness over the scapula, the deltoid. Um, we need to be specifically palpating that AC joint, possibly doing AC joint compression tests um, and keeping this injury in mind. Getting AP and axillary views if you have high clinical suspicion. Um, and then overview of the type. So type one and two, it's subtle joint space widening without significant joint displacement. They can have outpatient orthopedic follow-up as needed. Type three is kind of that middle ground. You have displacement of the clavicle to the superior edge of the acromion and they need uh, or orthopedic follow-up within one week. And then moving on to four, five, and six, this is where you have uh, type four, posterior displacement, um, type five, the untethered uh, superior displacement, and type six, inferior displacement. Um, all of these are going to require uh, emergency department orthopedic evaluation, uh, as well as evaluation for any disruption of the brachial plexus or subclavian uh, vasculature. And that's it.